Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's episode of Tech Talk with me, Kazim. Today, I have Alan O'Neill with me on the show, and uh, myself and Alan are going to be walking you through Azure ML service in a nutshell on today's episode. But, but before we do that, uh, Alan, how about I have you introduce yourself to my audience? Okay. Um, thanks very much for having me on, Kazim. It's an honor. Um, it's always good to um, talk to folk who are out in the community and, and sharing knowledge because um, I don't think, you know, if I look back to uh, when I started engineering um, uh, a lifetime ago, uh, the only things that I had to, you know, help me out and reference were either A, the, the people who are sitting either side of me at the desk, um, or B, maybe about 20 or 30 technical books that are sitting on a bookshelf shared in the office. And that was it. That was our world. So to sort of come from that to um, the modern day that we have now with, you know, so much information available to us on the internet, and all we have to do is go and bingle it. What's bingle, you say? Well, bingle is a combination <laughs> of Google and Bing because you don't want to go in and say, oh, I just use Google or I just use Bing, and one is as good as the other sometimes for different things. So I say I bingle things. So um, I go in and I, I bingle things up and... Um, I don't think there's a day goes past as an engineer that I don't go and type something into a search engine to say, how do I do this? Or, you know, cut and paste an error message in and see what somebody else's advice says is. So it's so, in my view, critically important to have shows like yours um, that reach out to um, both local and international communities to um, share knowledge and to um, let folk um, uh, not only see something new, but I think it's important to see something as well from a different perspective, because um, uh, it's funny, you know, I was talking to a guy uh, a couple of months back and he said, but, you know, why would I go and talk about this on a show or why would I go and write a blog about that because it's been done 100 times already? I said, but has it? When you go and you search for something, and it's interesting because this feeds into AI and, and machine learning as well, but when you go and search for something, you search for that query, that question, using your particular language as you speak, as you think, um, uh, uh, as, as you uh, uh, code. But the way that you ask that question is quite different to the way that somebody else might ask it. And this That's is true. what might be called the long tail problem. Um, that, you know, uh, if we look at um, uh, the way that people ask things, they may ask, when you boil it down, it could be exactly the same thing, but it could be the case that it's asked in 100 different ways. And if I don't write about something in my voice, the way that I think and I code and I know things, um, well, then somebody who might use the same type of voice or understanding as me, if I don't share that information, they miss it. Right? And they don't get that same lift that somebody else would. So this is why it's so critically important um, to not say, oh, pff, been done before, but to say, sure, yeah, dive in and, and, and say it and share it. Uh, that's awesome. My background, um, in case you hadn't guessed, is in engineering, mostly in uh, uh, enterprise. And um, I've covered everything from over the years from uh, mobile to large enterprise systems to um, big data to um, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things people say to me when I talk about machine learning and AI is, what's the difference between machine learning and AI? And I always tell them, I always get this into every talk, what's the difference? Well, the yeah, difference Yeah, I was is, going to ask that, yeah, actually, well, yes. It's very simple. The difference <laughs> is, the difference is, Machine learning is written in Python. Artificial intelligence is written in PowerPoint. <laughs> in, other words, <laughs> in other words, most of the time when you hear people talking yeah. artificial intelligence, they're actually business folk and they're uh, trying to talk to something that they don't really understand, right? Um, so it's like me saying, you know, what? what do you work in? Oh, well, I'm, you know, a sort of a, a, a data and machine learning engineer. Um, so what else could I answer with? Oh, I'm a computer science person. 
So that's almost the same thing as what's AI to ML. It's the applied function of uh, the theory, if you like. And AI is the family of things. Um, and then the ML is the application. Um, and there's a big distinction, let's say, between um, what people think that AI might be or, or is, which is, you know, um, this great robot in the sky that's going to control everything and take all our jobs and everything else. Um, uh, and we'll be able to read our minds, Elon Musk-like and everything else. But that's not the case. That's that's the, the holy grail of AI research, and it's called um, artificial general intelligence. And that means that it's like humans. It can kind of abstract over all sorts of different concepts and things, um, and it can answer many, many questions, and it can do different things in a very efficient way, the same way as we can, but a heck of a lot faster. But we're nowhere near yet, near that yet. In fact, we're decades away from that, right? Where we are is we're in the the stage of um, a narrow, specialized artificial intelligence. So we can put together an AI that's really, really good at image recognition, but only of dogs and cats. We can't say, um, can you be good at image recognition for everything? Let me ask you this, Alan, just uh, in case we have people also watching this, maybe at a later time now, who are not so very big on ML, like myself. You know, so, so do you want to please give us that workflow of a typical ML scenario so, so people can relate better now? Sure, sure. Okay, so um, let me tell you about a problem that we're working on at the moment, right? Um, and, and that will help to... Uh, bring it into context. So um, uh, we have a, a, a customer and um, they have um, some data in their database. And it's, it's not very clean data, it's dirty data. So this means that, for example, um, many years ago, I worked for an airline cargo company and um, one of the biggest shippers that was sending out goods from Ireland was called um, Microsift. That sounds a bit strange, Microsift, right? Now, <laughs> it, yeah. It turns out that it was Microsoft. Is that from China? No, oh. no, no. It turns out that it was Microsoft. But somebody who was entering the data on, on one of the early days instead of putting in M-I-C-R-O-S-O-F-T, put in S-I-F-T, because they're exactly the same on the keyboard. They're beside each other. And they miss, okay. miss keys, right? So Microsoft in Ireland, from a shipping point of view, for a long time was known as Microsoft, not Microsoft. So that's what we call dirty data, right? It's incorrect. It's bad data quality. And this means, for example, that if someone went into their database and said, well, we want to um, do a simple thing to say, well, show me all of the money that Microsoft owes us this week, right? Or that we owe to Microsoft. Um, or show me the amount of product, the quantity that Microsoft exported from Ireland, let's say, or um, uh, from Kazmagoo. It doesn't make any difference, right? Um, so they go in, they go, you know, um, select some of sales um, from Ireland where ship or equals to Microsoft, and they get $100. But that's wrong because we know that there's millions and millions and millions going out of there. And the problem is it got dirty data. And it's it should be Microsoft, not micro um, uh, sift. So um, what we're doing is we're going through their database and all of their terms, all of their words. And we're saying, um, is this a valid word? And not just, is this a valid word? Because you can say, well, micro sift could be a valid word. I mean, sift, sifting through things, micro sift, sifting through small things. Maybe it's a valid word. Um, so when we're talking about ML, we're generally not just talking about one thing. We're talking about that thing in the context of other things. So Microsoft in the context of being a software manufacturer is correct. Whereas micro sift in the context of being a software manufacturer is not correct. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is we would go through the database 
and we would take out the the words that are in that and we would say what's the context of this meant to be and then we would go out to um something like let's say gpt3 or um one of the other very very large um uh machine learning um corpuses databases if you like that's out there and we would say um uh, is it likely what's the probability because it always comes down to probability in machine learning what's the probability that for a computer manufacturer the company name is microsoft and it'll say very low what's the probability that it's microsoft it's very high and we can say ah we suggest that you change this particular word in here from microsoft to microsoft and bang that's what we're doing so how does that even come about? What's, as you say, the workflow to make this happen? So from the point of view of um, uh, general, you know, data science and data science workflows, um, it's one of those things that when we look at standard computer science and the workflow that we use in, you know, standard computer science stuff, we're trying to do something and um, we, we now have the ubiquitous CI, CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment, whereby we have our source code, we check in our source code, and it automatically runs some tests, some unit tests against that source code. Maybe it publishes then to the web, and then maybe it goes and does some um, usability testing automatically uh, against that. And that's part of the pipeline of how that piece of computer science, how that, that piece of work is actually done and achieved. And what we're doing now in machine learning is trying to mirror what we've done for many years in standard computer engineering. We're trying to say, okay, can we put this type of thing, can we put all of these things about machine learning into a pipeline to make the whole system more robust? And that's really important because when you do machine learning, um, you're never finished, right? It's like any kind of learning. Ne learning never stops. And what I mean by that is, um, if I go in today and I build what's called a model, okay, a machine learning model, which is just a way of doing things. So if I build a model that is based on knowing that actually whenever you see Microsoft, you should map that to Microsoft, um, that's not the end of the story. Because what happens in a week's time or a month or a year when somebody comes along and maybe they're using um, a Spanish keyboard or a German keyboard or a Chinese keyboard um, and they're typing in Microsoft again and it doesn't come out as Microsoft but comes out as, God knows, uh, micro claw <laughs> or micro cat or something, right? Because the world of internet needs more cats, so micro cat. So... Um, micro cat comes in there, but it's never seen it before. So what does it do? Well, it might kick it out and say, we, we don't know what this is. But the model needs to be updated to know that when you recognize that cat actually shouldn't be there, and that, well, maybe, maybe there's actually a new company called micro cat and they're actually a software catalog company and they should be in the context of Microsoft shipping the same software because they're also a ship software shipping company. So what we need to do is, in the, the pipeline that we would normally have for standard computer engineering, um, software engineering, um, we need to use that same theory um, of operations and, and efficiency for machine learning so that we can say, mm, we're going to um, not just run a unit test, but we're maybe going to run a test to say, is there anything new that's been kicked out recently that we haven't seen before? Like... Microcat, and if there is, um, uh, is the model starting to move away from the data? And we call this drift. So, are we seeing drift in the model? Are we seeing that last week it was giving us a um, an efficiency or predictability of you know ninety seven, ninety eight percent, whereas this week it's dropped back to eighty percent for some reason? So, this is a drift in the accuracy of the model, and we need to monitor for that. And if we do see that, we then need to do something in our pipeline to say, go off and investigate it or go and refresh the um, list of companies in the country to make sure that we 
uh, know that we now have a micro cap, not just a micro soft, but it's definitely not micro slit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's so there's always a chance of things not being yeah. 100%. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. It's ever changing. And it's really important, like all things, I suppose, in, in you know, software engineering, um, it's always important to continuously evaluate and to continuously ask your self the question, um, is this thing that I'm doing still valid? Does it still work okay. for the business use case that was put there in the first place? Because that's okay. what it's about. It's about a business use case. It's not about doing yes. something for fun. Well, sometimes it is, but mostly what you know pays for the roof over our heads and for our kids to go to school and everything else, that's business, right? So we okay. have to take care of business. You mentioned something, and I, I don't want to forget, right, uh, while you were trying to explain this, you mentioned uh, pipeline, right? Sometimes we have some novice listening into the show. So I don't want us to assume now, uh, you know, when people talk about machine learning, there, there are a few words or terminologies, I should say, that is often being thrown around, and pipeline is one of them. And, and I also, personally, I do hear of uh, now MLOps, right so so can you quickly tell us yeah what sure. is a pipeline and what is an mlops and how is an mlops different from devops that we all know about okay um we can really say at the end of the day when it boils down to it that mlops is exactly the same as devops but it's just for machine learning engineers right it's uh, okay. a way okay. of having a pipeline of processes <laughs> okay, that okay. are managed in a particular way where um, it is a process that measures the correctness and the efficiency um, of your automation steps. So whereas previously, if I wanted to go and publish a simple website or, or write an app, okay, um, I had to go off and I had to um, uh, go and do maybe a hundred different steps. Now, we say in software engineering and just engineering in general, whenever you find yourself repeating something more than two or three times, you should really refactor your code. You should really automate that particular <laughs> thing, right? So one of my, my senior engineers has a thing that he calls lazy Git. Now we know Git is a source control thing. And typically um, the workflow right, the personal pipeline that I have when I'm checking in code, and most people do, um, is we do um, a, a git add dot, which means add all of my code to the git repository, the source code. Um, and then I say uh, uh, git commit, I'm going to commit my code, minus m, which means, uh, uh, now here's a comment and everything else following, um, and I put a comment in, so it says, oh, I'm doing some refactoring, or here's some magic I just wrote, or ooh, I'm going to die awesome, right? Something like this, right? But I have to go every time, and I've got to write those things two or three times, and that's inefficient. That's repeating stuff. Now, my my far better half, my, my wonderful partner wife, will um, look and say, well, maybe those movements of the keys on your fingers on the keyboard will burn some more calories and that's good for your waistline. So keep doing it. Don't be lazy. Right? Um, my father always used to tell me that uh, a good engineer was a lazy engineer, right? In other words, you think things through hard before you actually do them or put your hand to the keyboard. So what um, Nick has come up with is a thing called lazy git. And what he does is he has written a script and he just types in LG space and the comment that he wants to commit his code with and presses enter, right? And that automates the previous two steps and it boils it down to one step. So when we talk about workflow, we talk about pipeline, we talk about DevOps and we talk about MLOps, ops. Ops is operations and it is automating one or more operations or tasks that we might do as a human but just boiling it down and having it done automatically. Now, of course, you'll say, well, things can go wrong, right? Because humans are fallible and humans get stuff wrong. So how can we ensure that we, we contain the possibility of stuff going wrong? So in these frameworks, 
they're called a framework for doing something like framework what does framework even mean well there's a framework for driving a car no there's a framework for living i love this one, I love this one. a framework for living right i wake up and i come awake and i wear and i go ooh. and i ask myself the first question is is it a weekday or is it weekend uh, if it's a weekday get your lazy ass out of bed if it's a weekend, ooh, I can hit the snooze button for 20 minutes and I can stay in a little bit longer, okay? That's a workflow. That's a workflow, right? And um, sometimes workflows go wrong. They, always, they don't always work the way you want them to work, right? So when you have a workflow and you're trying to orchestrate, right? You're trying to orchestrate these operations, these tasks, you, you put... Um, measures around them and you put um, uh, bits of robustness around them. It's like when you're um, uh, building a new house and you don't just go off and put bricks down and hope it goes up and it stays. You put scaffolding around it, okay? Scaffolding um, of metal or of bamboo or whatever they use in, in the particular area that you're in. Um, but this is what you do, you do scaffolding. And it's to allow people to, workers, to go up the building as it's growing safely, not to fall off. Um, it's to allow them to strap the building to something solid or semi-solid um, while it's being built. And then, of course, when the cement and everything dries, they can take down the scaffolding and off they go. And in DevOps and MLOps, we do exactly the same thing. We put these scaffoldings or these frameworks around the operations or the tasks that we do to ensure that they are error checked, to ensure okay. that they okay. are sanity checked, to ensure that they okay. are quality checked, all these different things. So whenever you hear, um, uh, you know, dev ops, ML ops, it's just a way of automating one or more tasks and monitoring those tasks to ensure that they're carried out to a certain level of acceptable quality for the business. So I want you to help me answer two more questions before we close out now. One of them, I want to ask you, uh, just like we have a low code, no code option for the traditional software development. So I want to ask, do we also have low code, no code option available for ML? Yes, it's called there... PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do. We do. We do. Okay. Um, and, and actually, this is one of the things that um, Azure um, and a Azure um, Machine Learning Services are, are really good at, um, or cognitive services or whatever they're called today. It doesn't really matter, right? The fact is, is that um, uh, um, as a profession, as an industry, right, the IT industry has, well, it's got many problems, but one of the problems that it has is we don't have enough people qualified in many, many different areas, okay? And one of the areas that we don't have people qualified enough in is machine learning and AI and, and these specialist things. And look, let's face it, not only is not everybody cut out to be a machine learning engineer, right? Because, um, and by the way, I'm the world's worst person at math and um, mathematics. I'm awful. I really am, right? But if I can do it, anybody can do it because I just boil it down to just pure logic, right? At the end of the day, even the most sophisticated AI is just a one or a zero. It's either yes or no. That's what it boils down to and the probability of it being a yes or no. So when we look at the Azure um, machine learning ecosystem, right, um, or the, the cognitive services, what they offer is they offer a layer of abstraction to people who don't know uh, machine learning on a deep level. Um, I recall years ago, I started getting into um, robotics, right? And um, we should have a talk actually sometime on robotics and IoT and um, Azure Digital Twins and those things would be fun. Um, and I'll also get a, a friend of mine to come online and he's actually devised a, a robotic arm um, for um, uh, handicapped people, it's just awesome, right? What he's doing on it. But I, di I digress. Um, if you have an engineer who knows how to use an API to, let's say, make a payment on Stripe, 
are to um, make a uh, a call to um, uh, uh, send something into a database, right? Right. So it's very very simple REST API. Okay. So they know how to use an API. What's an API? An application programming interface, and it is it is again an abstraction. What's an abstraction? Wow. So an abstraction is um, a way of hiding the complexity of something so that some somebody or something um, can do something that um, may normally be complex or uh, difficult for them to do. So, for example, um, if we look at uh, uh, email, and a lot of us get an awful lot of spam coming into our email boxes, right? How do you know what's spam and what's not spam? Well, you certainly know that um, when uh, Colonel um, uh, uh, Kazim from um, uh, uh, Outer Mongolia sends you an email and says, it's your lucky day. Um, I am the Prime Minister of Mongolia and I have just got twenty hundred million dollars and you are the single recipient. All you have to do is give me your credit card or your bank details, right? <laughs> so you know that that's wrong, okay? This guy is a scammer and you got to avoid him, right? So how do we know that, right? Well, the computer knows certain words and certain combinations of words and certain IPs that you might send a, 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 um, a, an email from. It knows that these are known spam uh, entities, right? But I'm not a machine learning engineer. I'm not a spam expert. So what can I do if I want to write a simple system that says, for my website or for my phone app, how can I tell when somebody is posting a comment onto that, that it's spam or it's it's bad, it's bad news, right? It's not a, a genuine person. Well, we can call an API, we can call um, a service on uh, Azure, and we can say, please classify whether this is spam or not spam. And if it is spam, it'll send you back a one, positive, or if it's not spam, it'll send you maybe a zero for it's negative or the other way around, whatever it is, right? Um, in the same way, you have many, many websites, and all those websites are selling products, right? Or maybe it's um, they they have a, a blog and they're talking about something. And one of the problems with allowing people to comment and review on things is that sometimes people will leave a positive review of a product or a person or an event, Sometimes they leave a negative review, right? So it's the same thing, spam, not spam, negative, positive, right? How can we tell the sentiment of somebody's review of a product? Because from a, a business point of view, let's say I produce the iPhone, right? Um, gosh, I wish I did. I'd be a multimillionaire. But in any case, let's say I did, right? Um, uh, I want to say to Kazim, hey, I want you or your team to write me some software that monitors all of the customer comments. And anytime somebody posts a negative comment, I want you to send me a text message so that I can immediately go online and say, oh, I can help you out. Please don't say anything bad about our product, right? And we'll help you and make it good and everything else. Because a business will tell you that um, bad news travels fast, good news travels very slowly. So it's better to capture the bad news before it gets out of control, right? So. Um, if if you or me are not kind of experts in this area, what can we do? Well, we can call an endpoint. We can call a service. We can call um, an API. Um, we can call um, a, a DLL. Whatever you know it to be in your engineering parlance for you, you can call that thing from Azure Cognitive Services, Machine Learning Services, and you can say, give me an analysis of the sentiment of this thing. And not only... Can you say, give it to me in English? You could say, give it to me in Polish or in Swahili or in um, uh, Azerbaijani or whatever they happen to speak, right? Korean or Japanese or, you know, um, uh, Irish, Gaelic, Welsh Gaelic, right? All these different things. So another service that's abstracted would be um, a photograph on Azure um, uh, 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 vision services. So I hold up a picture of a cat and I say, is this a cat? And it'd say, yes, it's a cat. I would say, well, Here's a chihuahua and here's a muffin. Which is it? Is it muffin or chihuahua? 
right? And it'll tell me. So I don't have to use um, my own knowledge and I don't have to use my own time to go off and spend three years getting a PhD, learning about this vision analysis. I can just say, no, I'll use the service that Microsoft offers to me um, uh, for what is in actual fact, a very, I don't know how they do it. It's a very, very fair fee, a very small charge, and a lot of it's free for a certain amount um, to be able to do this stuff for us. Um, and a lot of the Microsoft services are like that. They abstract okay. away difficult and complex things and allow you as an engineer to ask a very simple question to what's probably a very complex underlying um, set of instructions or technologies, and it gives you a simple answer back. Right? And that's what a lot of the ML okay. services do. And the interesting part is then when you look into something like um, the Azure ML uh, platform, it will allow you to go in there um, in a visual way and to actually set up a kind of drag and drop, a bit like what you were saying earlier on about the uh, low code, no code. You can go no in code, there yeah. and you can not only call a service and code, but you can also go in visually and you can use your drag and drop mouse and everything else um, to solve machine learning problems for you. One of the problems that we have in machine learning is to be able to even know what approach do I use? Do I use this algorithm or that algorithm or this library or that library? So now they have what's called AutoML. And AutoML is you go and you say, I don't know what I'm looking for, but this is what the output should be. Can you please figure out the best method for me to use? And it goes where, 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 all the cogs turn away, and then pfft, magic, there's your answer. Right? And that's yeah, auto yeah. ML. So it's gradually getting better all the time. It's gradually getting more user friendly. And we're very much going towards um, the, the overarching concepts of low code, no code in the ML space. Um, and I think it's, it's only a matter of time um, before, uh, I mean, look, um, one of the things that fascinates me right now, last week I was in Berlin. I don't speak German, right? I'm, it's unfortunate I don't, but I don't. And I was sitting down in front of a menu and my good wife is trying to get me to lose some weight because I'm too fat. And I was looking at the menu and I couldn't figure out was I about to buy a cheesecake or a nice place of lean salad. I had no idea what I was about to buy. So what did I do? I went in and I picked up my phone and I went into a, a live translation service, right? It took a photograph, live video, of the menu, and it over it translated it. It sent that video to the, the cloud. It translated it into my mother tongue, which is English, and sent it back down to me. And then it overlaid the text on top of the menu, live, in real time. English. Like, <laughs> Mind absolutely blown, right? This is like if any of your viewers have ever seen um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or read this book, um, there's a thing in it which is an automatic translator and it's a fish and it's called a Babel fish. And you put this fish into your ear and then you will hear everything in your own language, right? So it's like Babel fish has come to life, but it's on Microsoft Cloud. It's just awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't want you to go before. Uh, I ask you this question, uh, Alain. <clears throat> Machine learning, just like you mentioned, we, we don't have a lot of people in that space yet. So it's a very hot area of tech as we speak now. But but people, if we have people out there that are not sure, right, whether they should learn ML now. So so please, let's learn from your wealth experience here. Why should anyone learn machine learning this 2022 and uh, what are some of the resources that you think can get new people started? Okay. First of all, it's a wonderful world because you can do everything for free now. You don't need to go to a college. You don't need to spend thousands on a university. You can get it all for free on the internet. I mean, God, you could go off and you could do surgery on the internet and you can learn how to do it from YouTube, right? Brain surgery. I'm the brain surgeon. Awesome. So um, the thing is, uh, uh, when I talked about abstraction earlier, right, um, and uh, complex things being made simpler via APIs and online services, etc., this is also happening in ML itself. So something that was very difficult a few years ago, uh, for example, was how do you identify the part of speech in, in natural language, 
right? How do you know that something is a noun and something is a pronoun, something is an adjective and something is a verb? How do you know these things? Um, and you would have to do a lot, a lot of work and a lot of research to find this out. But now there's libraries coming out that abstract over that and they've already done the work for you. So you just say, here's some text. What are the nouns? What are the verbs? What are the adjectives? And it'll tell you, it'll tag these for you, right? So you don't have to go, if you want to get into, first of all, um, uh, if you don't do machine learning now as an engineer, it's not a case of if you should, but when you should, right? It's like your website is going to get hacked. It's not if it's going to get hacked, it's when it's going to get hacked, right? <laughs> machine learning is all around us. And at some stage, you're going to be asked the question, can we do this thing? And this thing, the answer will be, do it with machine learning. You don't have to be a machine learning engineer to interact with machine learning. An awful lot of what you can do is already there in pre-made services um, with the likes of Azure ML services, right? So the starting point is not to go off and get 10 books and say, I must go and sign up for a PhD. That is not the starting point, right? The starting point actually is you go to Azure AI University or Azure AI School, and they have a fantastic resource there that will take you through everything from the basics of basic data science, basic machine learning, how to use things like the sentiment analysis endpoint, right? Which even when you do that, you go, wow, I just did some machine learning, right? It's abstracted 10 layers, but that doesn't matter. You were able to provide a service of machine learning then to someone in your business who wants it. And as you learn more, you will discover that machine learning is not usually about huge breakthroughs. It's about doing little things and chaining them together in a pipeline. <laughs> right. So to bring it all back together, why should you learn machine learning? Because if you don't, you will be left behind, right? Do you have to go and do a PhD to learn this stuff? No, you don't. You go and start with, um, look up, it's either Azure AI School or Azure AI University, I can't remember which, but look that up. Um, and they've got a whole curriculum for free for you to follow. And you may say, but that's only the, you know, Azure and Microsoft focus stuff. It may be so, but you're still learning the fundamentals. And once you learn the fundamentals, then you can move on to something else. And it goes back to any form of learning and uh, uh, any form of, of doing something new. You've got to start somewhere, right? When we wake up in the morning, we all put one foot out of bed. We don't jump and go, woo, I'm up and dressed and everything else. Everybody has to put one foot out of the bed. That's where it starts, right? And learning is the same way. Start simple and work your way up. And don't be uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, go back a level, do it again. And maybe that's where you want to stay. And that's okay. Or maybe you'll find a different area. But you will find a comfort level. And the AI school is a, a great place to start. Thank you very much, Alain. So it's really been very insightful. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us on the show today. Uh, so, but uh, if we have people looking to connect with you, how can they reach you? And uh, then any last words from you before we say bye-bye? Sure. The simplest thing is you can get me on Twitter. And if you look down there, there, that's, that's my Twitter <laughs> handle thing. It's Databytes AI because if we don't have data, well, then we don't have AI, right? So <laughs> kind of yeah. on that, data bytes AI. So you'll find me on that on, on, on Twitter. Um, you can grab me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also very involved in the C Sharp Corner community. You can find that online. Um, you can ask questions up there. Um, and uh, please, God, when um, we're, we're all free of COVID and all of the other weird, strange, wonderful things and not so wonderful things that are happening in the world at the moment, um, uh, I'll be flying around like a a muffin filled chihuahua again and you'll see me at different conferences and exhibitions uh, all over the globe so there we go <laughs> thank you so much so you've had it from alan himself so i hope uh, you've been able to pick a lesson or two from uh, alan's 
uh, flawless, I should say, you know, explanation and his way of just breaking things down into smithereens, right? So, so here is where we're going to call it a close now on today's episode of the show. So you can have a rewatch of the previous episode on YouTube. So it's a tech talk uh, with Kazim on YouTube. So uh, from myself and Alan, now it's a bye bye, and I'll catch you again another time. Take care, Thank everyone. Tune in next week. Thank you. Bye.